Good. Okay. So uh, let me just first quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Josh Cohen. Uh, I teach at uh, Stanford in political science, philosophy, and law. I taught here at MIT from 1977 until 2006, and then I jumped ship. Um, but first loves, I love MIT first, and I love MIT best. Um, it's true. Uh, and uh, uh, I've also, since 1991, been editor of Boston Review, and since 2002, doing that jointly with my friend and colleague, Deb Chasman, who has given up her seat to, I shouldn't say that because the police are going to kick you out if you're not in a seat. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, uh, so, I'm here, I, I came from uh, San Francisco, flew from San Francisco last night to be here uh, today for this event, which is the first in this year's, as you can see, uh, Ideas Matter series. Ideas Matter, uh, for those of you who uh, can't read what it says there, Ideas Matter is a joint project of Boston Review and the MIT uh, Department of uh, Political Science. It's a, a forum that we've been holding for the past year on important public issues. Now, for Boston Review, as you can see from our logo, uh, Ideas Matter defines who we are. And Ideas Matter at Boston Review in a very specific way. So we think that a, a flourishing, successful democracy depends on open public discussion, discussion disciplined by reason. Reason, that means argument and evidence. Uh, for those of you who have been away from Earth for the past few years, you'll, you won't have noticed that that's not the way the world actually works. Um, but still, that is... Uh, what we are about, to foster that open public discussion disciplined by evidence and argument. That's our mission. It's our core defining commitment. And we share that conviction with the political science department here, which is chaired by my friend uh, Richard Locke, who's sitting in the front row. And because of that common conviction, we decided a year ago that we were going to put on this uh, series of uh, public discussions on fundamental issues of common concern. As I said, this is the first for this year, and it's really great to have with us uh, today Noam Chomsky, uh, a colleague, former colleague of mine, an old friend. Uh, now, Noam, uh, you all know Noam needs no introduction, and it's good that he doesn't need one because you can't give him one. Uh, you can't give him one because if you try to talk about what he's written, uh, for everything he's written, he's written something more recently than that. So there's no finite introduction that you can give. Noam gets the joke, even if no one else does. Anyway, um, so in lieu of... In lieu of uh, an introduction of Noam, what I want to do is tell a story um, that really shows, I think, how Noam is responsible, and I mean this very sincerely, how Noam is responsible for our uh, being here today uh, in this room. So I first met Noam in 1975 when I was a graduate student at Harvard in the philosophy department, and uh, Noam was uh, good enough to come over to the to talk to a bunch of graduate students in philosophy. We had to sneak him in the back way so Quine and Goodman didn't see that he was corrupting the youth. Uh, but we did get him in. And uh, in preparation for that uh, discussion, an informal discussion group, we all read Noam's 1967 essay on the responsibility of intellectuals. And I can't say that I remember the subsequent the discussion with full vividness, but one thing I do remember very clearly, and that is that I came out of reading Noam's essay and having that conversation with him, thinking that the core, a core proposition in that essay was true. That is, 
that people who are in the situation that I was entering into, that is, intellectuals in universities, were in a position of great privilege, and with that privilege came considerable responsibility, a responsibility to bring the kind of uh, education and easy access to information that you have in this privileged position into public discussion. That struck me as true, and I decided then, on the basis of that reading and conversation, that I was always going to have one foot in the academy and one foot outside the academy. And so in the 80s, I did various things in Latin America and uh, nuclear weapons. And then in 1991, a, a friend and member of the board of Boston Review, Nick Bramell, told me that the editor and publisher was leaving and was looking for somebody to take over Boston Review. Uh, I didn't know anything about magazines. I hadn't been on my high school newspaper, but I thought this was a fantastic opportunity, a huge opportunity to continue to act on that conviction that Noam had uh, defined, articulated in that essay and uh, conversation. So I uh, decided that I would uh, become editor of uh, Boston Review. Now, I wish, of course, that over the past 20 years, I've been doing it for 20 years now, I wish that we had been more effective, and I hope that we're more effective in the future than we've been thus far. But I also have a sense of pride in what the review has done, and more to the point, I'm very grateful to Noam for crisply stating that founding principle uh, on which uh, Boston Review is based. Noam Chomsky. Uh, first question always is whether you can hear me in the back. Yeah? Okay. Uh, early this year, Deb uh, Trasman suggested that it uh, might be interesting for me to review, rethink some uh, issues and questions that came up in uh, the article that uh, Josh just mentioned. It's a mid-60s article. Uh, it, uh, the timing is propitious. It's timed for the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and uh, though we didn't know it at the time, it would also be uh, timed with the uh, assassination of Osama bin Laden, the chief the prime suspect for 9-11. Uh, which uh, brings to an end in some fashion at least one phase of the uh, so-called war on terror that uh, George Bush redeclared, I stress redeclared, on uh, right after 9-11. They redeclared it because it had been declared 20 years earlier by Ronald Reagan as he came into office. Uh, his administration announced that a prime focus of U.S. foreign policy would be uh, to deal with uh, uh, state-directed international terrorism, which they described as you know, the plague of the modern age, uh, return to barbarism in our time, and so on. And then they did so. Now, that, incidentally, has been kind of erased from history because the results were so horrendous and uh, incompatible with uh, the picture we're supposed to have of, it, of ourselves, that it has to be gone. Uh, so in any event, Bush redeclared the war in uh, 10 years ago, and some, in some sense, some phase of it uh, ended now. Uh, the article in question was actually a talk, uh, undergraduate, a talk to undergraduates at Harvard, 1966, uh, published in a Harvard undergraduate newspaper, uh, then picked up and distributed. The title and the topic, uh, Responsibility of Intellectuals, wasn't original. I got it. I took it from both the title and the topic from some very impressive uh, essays that had influenced me a lot uh, 20 years earlier, uh, right after the Second World War. Uh, there was a great journal called Politics run by Dwight MacDonald, uh, and he had a series of articles there thinking about the war and its aftermath, concerned with what he called uh, 
responsibility of peoples and uh, in particular responsibility of intellectuals. Uh, the focus in his article, and indeed the traditional focus of this question, is the relation of intellectuals to uh, state violence from one point of view, his and mine, state crimes. Uh, that's the traditional focus. The term intellectual, in fact, entered modern usage in its current sense. Uh, with the Dreyfus trial, uh, the Dreyfus Ards, uh, Emil Zola, his associates, uh, uh, harshly condemned uh, what they took to be uh, criminal acts of the state. Uh, that's the origin of the notion. And it, the, that focus remains until today. I'll come back to that. Uh, it, it, I think it's useful to recall the circumstances in 1966 when this was being, at least in my view, re revived. So uh, uh, I'll just quote the most, uh, the general, uh, the most uh, respected uh, uh, analyst and commentator on the Vietnam War, Bernard Fall actually the one person, the one non-governmental source that Robert McNamara uh, respectfully cites in his uh, memoirs, uh, a Vietnam historian, military historian. Uh, in October 1965, just a couple of months before my talk, uh, he wrote that what changed the character of the Vietnam War was not the decision to bomb North Vietnam, February 65, and not the decision to uh, use American ground troops in South Vietnam sent a couple months later, but the decision to wage unlimited aerial warfare inside the country at the price of literally pounding the place to bits. He's talking about South Vietnam. Uh, according to his estimate, by then more than 150 South Vietnamese had been killed, as he put it, by state terror, and the crushing weight of American armor napalm, jet bombers, and finally, vomiting gases. Uh, about a year later, shortly before his death in combat, his last article, uh, he wrote that uh, Vietnam as a cultural and historic entity is threatened with extinction, while in the South, the countryside literally dies under the blows of the largest military machine ever unleashed on an area of this size. And there was ample evidence available to substantiate those judgments, even apart from his work. Uh, that's the situation roughly at the time that I actually reread uh, McDonald's essays uh, after 20 years and talked about it at Harvard and then wrote about it. Uh, uh, the, uh, this was a period when there was very intensive, unusual, maybe almost unique uh, discussion among intellectuals about uh, the nature, about, about these issues, enormous discussion over it. And it, it had a kind of a framework. It, uh, it was divided into what are called doves and hawks, uh, modern term, but the concept goes way back. Uh, the, to pick maybe two of the most prominent examples, uh, one of the most promising, prominent hawks was Joseph Halsop. Uh, his view was that uh, if we simply poured in more troops, more bombs, more destruction, we could win the war. At the other end of the spectrum was his friend and antagonist, uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, liberal historian, had been a Kennedy advisor. Uh, he, uh, he wrote in 1966 that he disagreed with Alsop. Uh, he didn't think that it would work. Uh, this is the extreme critical position. So he wrote that uh, we, all, we all pray that Mr. Alsop will be right and that what amounted to the surge of that day will be able to suppress the resistance. And if it does, we may all be saluting the wisdom and statesmanship of the American government in winning victory while leaving, I'm still quoting, while leaving the tragic country gutted and devastated by bombs burned by napalm, turned into a wasteland by chemical defoliation, a land of ruin and wreck with its political and institutional fabric pulverized. He's talking about South Vietnam. But he felt that uh, escalation probably won't succeed and will prove to be too costly. 
Uh, so therefore, he disagreed with Alsop. He thought that uh, a strategy should be rethought. Now that's approximately the spectrum of uh, what's called responsible intellectual uh, position. Uh, it's, uh, again, at a moment of very intensive uh, discussion, maybe never equaled since or before. Uh, there was another view. It was expressed by uh, former Harvard Dean uh, McGeorge Bundy, uh, uh, after that uh, National Security Advisor for Kennedy and Johnson, had an article in Foreign Affairs, the main Foreign Affairs Journal, in which he denounced what he called the wild men in the wings. That's the other category, outside the hooked of spectrum. Uh, the wild men in the wings were doing things like uh, criticizing what he called the first team that was conducting the war. And they even went so far as to raise some questions about its uh, nobility. Uh, those wild men in the wings were, in fact, uh, appalled by what uh, uh, Fall and Schlesinger was describing and what we knew very well. I thought it was a horrendous crime and were trying to dedicate themselves to stopping it. At that point, a protest, which had, was very, very hard to elicit, it's not like what people think, but it finally was beginning, and at that point it was already turning to resistance. Uh, that aroused a considerable contempt and fury among the responsible intellectuals. Uh, well, Schlesinger, for example, and Bundy, of course. Uh, these distinctions between the responsible intellectuals and the wild men in the wings, uh, they go back to the origins of the uh, discussion of intellectuals and crimes of state. So back to the Dreyfusards, again, when this sort of entered public discussion. Uh, the responsible men were people like what were called the immortals of the French Academy, you know, the super respectable intellectuals. Uh, they were uh, the responsible intellectuals of the day. Uh, the Dreyfusards, incidentally a minority group, though they're the ones we remember, uh, they were uh, off the spectrum. Uh, they were denounced, I'll quote some of the phrases of the immortals, uh, they were denounced as anarchists of the lecture platform, in fact, the very word intellectual, which was just coming into use, uh, proclaimed one of the most ridiculous eccentricities of our time. I mean, the pretensions of uh, raising writers, scientists, professors, and philologists uh, to the rank of supermen who dare to treat our generals as idiots, our social institutions as absurd, and our traditions as unhealthy, wild men in the wings. And they weren't treated very nicely. You know, Emil Zola was the leading figure, uh, was forced to flee France to escape prison. Uh, that's traditional, too. The term intellectual wasn't used before, but the notion goes way back. And the distinction between responsible and wild men in the wings goes back to the origins of uh, recorded history. And the same is true of the way they're treated. Uh, the wild men in the wings are not treated very nicely. Uh, the next stage, the dramatic stage in the history of modern intellectuals came a couple of years later uh, when the First World War broke out. And that's an interesting moment in intellectual history. On all sides, all sides, without exception, uh, the great mass of intellectuals, almost all of them, uh, mobilized themselves with enormous enthusiasm to support the war as a effort of unsurpassed nobility. Uh, the, uh, the United States was particularly enthousi enthusiastic, not only supporting Wilson's war. You may recall that Woodrow Wilson won election in 1916 uh, on the promise, uh, on, the, on the doctrine, uh, peace without victory, which he instantly inverted to victory without peace and that led to enormous enthusiasm for the war in Boston, for example. Uh, Boston Symphony Orchestra couldn't play um, Beethoven, you know, things like that. Uh, total hysteria. But the liberal intellectuals were particularly extreme. I mean, basically John Dewey's circle, New Republic. Uh, they not only 
praised the noble effort, but they took responsibility for it. I think that went beyond what was happening in the other countries. So to quote the New Republic, the leading liberal intellectual journal of the day, the effective and de decisive work on behalf of the war has been accomplished by a class which must comprehensively but l be loosely described as the intellectuals, still a new term. These are the progressives who ensured that the United States entered the war un under the influence of a moral verdict reached after the utmost deliberation by the more thought thoughtful members of the community, namely us, who incidentally were the victims of one of the world's first great propaganda agencies, the British Ministry of Information, as it was called, namely Ministry of Disinformation, which was designed to control the mind of the world and particularly the mind of progressive American intellectuals uh, who they felt correctly could kind of help mobilize the population to join the war. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to talk about the way that war is viewed in retrospect. I'll leave that. Uh, John Dewey, the leading figure, uh, drew uh, the lessons of the war. He, sa he said the lessons of the war, the main lesson is that the intelligent men of the community, us, uh, the intelligent men of the community can take hold of human affairs and manage them deliberately and intelligently to achieve the ends sought, which incidentally are admirable by definition. That's another traditional doctrine, very rarely challenged, just to skip a couple of years. At the end of the Vietnam War, of course, again, a big flurry of writing, 1975, and it's interesting to review it, lots and lots of articles about the meaning of the war and so on. Again, usually divided, you know, hawks and doves and so on, but at the very dovish extreme, about as far as you can get, uh, was uh, Anthony Lewis of the New York Times. Uh, he opened his retrospective article by saying that the war began with bungling efforts to do good. Uh, they were efforts to do good by definition. That's a tautology. Our government carried them out, so they were efforts to do good. No evidence needed. And they were bungling because it didn't work very well. Uh, kind of like uh, Obama's uh, comment about the war in Iraq, a strategic blunder, he considered a very heroic statement. I don't think anybody's pointed out that you could have read that statement in Pravda in 1985, referring to the invasion of Afghanistan. And in fact, you could have heard it among the German general staff after the defeated Stalingrad. Two-front war was strategic blunder. But in our system, that's ultra courageous. Uh, so we began with bungling efforts to do good, but he said by 1969, it was clear that it had become a disaster. It was obvious that it was a mistake. That we could not bring democracy to Vietnam at a cost acceptable to ourselves. That we were trying to bring democracy again is a kind of a tautology. Uh, and so at the very same time, that's the extreme criticism Then there's everything else. Uh, the uh, uh, public opinion was polled at that time, roughly at that time. The Chicago Council on Public uh, Foreign Relations was beginning to carry out regular polls of attitudes on foreign on, uh, towards foreign affairs, and they're quite interesting. Uh, from say, about the mid '70s up till I think the latest that the question was asked, probably about 10 years ago, uh, the numbers were pretty steady. Uh, in '75, about uh, roughly then, about 70 percent of the population described the war as not a mistake, as fundamentally wrong and immoral. And those figures remained pretty constant. Now, rather interestingly, there was never a follow-up question. Why do you think it was fundamentally wrong and immoral? And the reason there was no fo follow-up question was, in fact, explained by the academic specialist on public opinion, who, well-known professor, who uh, organized the polls. Uh, it's because he knew the answer. Uh, he knew the answer. Uh, people said that because too many American soldiers were being killed. Uh, that's the only possible answer. Well, maybe that's what people meant. Uh, you can think of an alternative, but uh, that doesn't even enter into consciousness. So the question was never asked. 
you can only guess. Uh, well, the, uh, at around the same time, we're now mid-70s, uh, these distinctions that I've been mentioning became quite explicit and reasonably well defined. Uh, the clearest exposition of them was an important book, which you should read if you haven't. When the book came out, I had a feeling it was going to be taken out of print, so I ordered about 20 copies for the MIT <laughs> library, and indeed it was taken out of print, but there ought to be copies in the library. It's the uh, Trilateral Commission report on the crisis of democracy. The Trilateral Commission is the liberal internationalists, sort of those, of the three trilateral areas, uh, uh, industrial democracies, Europe, uh, Japan, and the United States, leading liberal commentators. Now, the complexion is illustrated by the fact that the Carter administration was drawn almost completely from their ranks. Uh, the book is interesting. It's called The Crisis of Democracy. Uh, they were very concerned that in the 60s, the so-called time of troubles, it's called the time of troubles because it had a a very significant effect in civilizing the country in many ways, which is pretty dangerous. Uh, so that's the time of troubles. Uh, they said there was just too much democracy. It was an excess of democracy. And that puts too much of a burden on the state, which can't respond to all these pressures. Uh, the pressures were coming from groups that they called special interests. They're always called special interests, like uh, young people, uh, old people, uh, women, uh, farmers, labor, you know, in other words, the population. They're supposed to be passive and apathetic. They never mentioned another group, uh, concentrated capital, corporate sector. And that's correct, because they represent the national interest by definition. So you don't have to go into it. But the special interests are putting too much pressure on the state. They have to learn how to uh, develop more moderation in democracy. I'm virtually quoting. The people, the special interests have to go back to being passive and apathetic and let the intelligent men of the community run the affairs of state. Uh, in the course of this discussion, they did go into the usual categories of intellectuals, gave them different names. Uh, one category is what they called the value-oriented intellectuals, the bad guys. Uh, the second category was the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals. That's the good guys. Uh, the first ones, the value-oriented, they're the wild men in the wings. And they are dangerous. Uh, as they put it, they pose a challenge to democratic government, which is potentially at least as serious as those posed in the past by aristoc aristocratic cliques, fascist movements, and communist parties. They devote themselves to derogation of leadership, the challenging of authority, they even challenge the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. That's you. Uh, that's their phrase, incidentally, not mine. Interesting phrase. Uh, the good guys, the technocratic and value-oriented, and, uh, uh, and, and policy-oriented intellectuals, they are responsible, serious scholars who devote themselves to the constructive work of shaping policy within established institutions and established structures of power. And they ensure that indoctrination of the young proceeds on course. Actually, some very interesting changes began to take place right at that time in the nature of the universities, which were explicit, not just in this document, kind of on the liberal end, but on the conservative end. The most important example is the Powell Memorandum. If you haven't read it, you should have. You should coming out of the right wing, Nixon administration, later Supreme Court justice, uh, discussing in some detail how business should intervene to ensure that indoctrination of the young proceeds on course. I can't prove it, but I think if anybody investigated it, they'd probably find that things like uh, the sharp rise in tuitions uh, dates back to about that time, and probably for these reasons, the disciplinary technique uh, has no economic basis in poor countries like Mexico, education's free, you know. but uh, and a lot of other things at the same time. Even university architecture was affected. People don't kid around, and lots more. Uh, well, that's, uh, there's a further distinction that we can make just keeping now to the uh, 
well, let me begin by mentioning, just as background, what's, I suppose, the most elementary moral principle that you can think of. It's found in some form in every code, every moral code, every culture I know about. It's sometimes called the principle of universality. Uh, you should hold yourselves to the same standards that you apply to others, in fact, more stringent ones. Uh, that's as close to truism, moral truism, as there is. And that principle is universal in two other important respects. One, it's almost universally approved in words. Two, it's almost universally rejected in practice uh, without any sense of contradiction. Uh, that's worth looking into. Uh, so for example, with regard to our enemies, when they do something bad, um, you can't contain the fury and indignation and you know, denunciation of you know, how can humans descend to such vile behavior. Uh, you don't do anything about it because it's their crimes. You can't do anything about it. Uh, you carry out intensive forensic analyses. So if you take a look at the, uh, say, after the, the Kosovo War, you know, every bone that can be found somewhere is picked up to see if uh, you can tell who did it. You know, blame it on them. Uh, at the same time, there were comparable or worse atrocities in East Timor, which we were supporting. And there's no forensic analysis. In fact, uh, Clinton intervened to prevent any analysis until the uh, uh, tropical uh, season began, so everything was destroyed. And that's quite typical. Uh, there's, uh, uh, with regard to our, uh, uh, our crimes, we know very little. Actually, John Terman just wrote it interesting and important book trying to redress who's here, they balance a little bit on this, it may be the first one. Uh, for our crimes, they're mistakes. Uh, they're strategic blunders. You know, they're blundering efforts to do good and so on. No investigation, we don't know anything. Uh, for the enemy, uh, comparable, maybe even lesser crimes are uh, just uh, unbelievably unspeakable. Uh, well, there's a corollary to the principle of universality which is again a moral truism, you should, you can't do everything, you have to distribute your energies and you should focus them on uh, things you can do something about. So for example, it's fine to denounce the crimes of Genghis Khan, but it has no moral value. Maybe write a good thesis on it. Uh, with regard to our own crimes, that's very important because you can do a lot about them, especially in a pretty free country uh, where you're not concerned much with uh, punishment. Uh, you can do a lot to try to mitigate or to end them. So, of course, that's where uh, effort should be concentrated by, again, the most elementary moral considerations. Uh, practice is virtually the opposite. Wherever you look, my examples, in fact, are kind of misleading uh, because they suggest that maybe these are you know, you know, not selected appropriately. In fact, it's virtually ubiquitous. No matter what category you look at, whether it's... Uh, aggression, uh, terror, uh, the fashionable modern bu buzzwords, uh, humanitarian intervention, uh, uh, R2P, responsibility to protect, uh, use of the term dissident, almost anything you look at, it's exactly the opposite of what the most elementary moral principles would predict. Uh, there's actually a further distinction, I mentioned it already, uh, just keeping to the, uh, the crimes of one's own state that is, the important ones on moral grounds, uh, the, the responsible intellectuals and the wild men in the wings are treated quite differently. Again, the wild men in the wings are the Dreyfusards, uh, those who refused to march in the parade during World War I, uh, wild men of the mid-60s and so on. They're treated differently. Uh, the responsible intellectuals are praised, uh, admired. Uh, World War I is an interesting case. I said that on all sides almost everybody was mobilized, but there were some notable exceptions. On, in England, the most prominent exception was Bertrand Russell, who was jailed. Uh, in Germany, the uh, most known notable exceptions were Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, jailed. Uh, in the United States, uh, Eugene Debs, presidential candidate, leading labor leader, uh, he was jailed for questioning the nobility of uh, 
Wilson's War. Uh, uh, Thorstein Veblen, famous political economist, wasn't jailed. He was kicked out of the Wilson administration because he wrote a he wrote a paper, he was in the administration, he wrote a paper uh, showing that the, there was a kind of an, a food crisis. He said it could be alleviated if Wilson put an end to his harsh repression of the labor movement, particularly the IWW, which he virtually crushed. So he was thrown out of the government. Uh, Randolph Bourne, one of the main intellectuals in the Dewey Circle, he was thrown out of all the journals, couldn't publish and denounced, of course. Uh, well, that's uh, First World War. Uh, and it continues pretty much the same way. Uh, how it works it depends on the nature of the society. So, for example, in a Russian satellite, Stalinist satellite, say Czechoslovakia in the 80s, uh, uh, critics, we call them dissidents, like, say, Václav Havel, uh, could be jailed. In an American satellite, at the very same time, uh, they just have their heads blown off, their brains blown out. Uh, it's a radical difference. And that, in fact, is far more general. And it's known to scholarship. So if you take a look at the uh, recent uh, Cambridge History of the Cold War, there's an article by John Coatsworth on Latin America, a well-known Latin Americanist. Uh, he points out that uh, from the early 60s to the Soviet collapse in 1990, I'm quoting him now, the numbers of political prisoners torture victims, uh, executions of nonviolent political dissenters in Latin America vastly exceeded those in the Soviet Union and its Eastern European satellites. Now, that included many religious martyrs and also mass slaughter, which didn't occur in the Soviet satellites, uh, consistently supported, often initiated in Washington, uh, generally supported by the responsible intellectuals, uh, opposed and resisted by the wild men like Josh in the 80s, uh, generally out of history. It, it really is out of history. If there happens to be a graphic illustration of it in my, my office here over in Stata Building, about uh, 15 years ago, I guess, I was given a rather evocative uh, painting by a Jesuit priest. Uh, the painting shows uh, uh, the Angel of Death, it's graphically presented, sort of schematically. The Angel of Death, uh, Archbishop Romero, called the Voice of the People, Voice of the Voiceless, who was assassinated in 1980 while reading Mass. And incidentally, shortly after he had sent a letter to President Carter pleading with him not to send military aid to the junta because it would just be used to crush people struggling for their elementary human rights. So he's at one end of the picture, and uh, down below are six uh, leading Latin American intellectuals, uh, Jesuit priests, whose brains were blown out in November 1989, right, a couple days after the fall of the Berlin Wall, by uh, an elite Salvadoran battalion, which already had killed thousands or tens of thousands of people. Uh, fresh from their, they had just returned from the United States. They had just had renewed training at the John F. Kennedy School of Special Warfare in North Carolina. Now, they were acting under the specific command of the, high, of the high command. That was published two years ago in the Spanish press, yet to be published here. Uh, the high command was very close to the American embassy, inconceivable, they didn't know. So that's also in the same portrait, there's a picture of uh, their housekeeper and her daughter, they had to be murdered too on orders of the high command so there wouldn't be any witnesses. Uh, that's the portrait. I keep it there kind of to remind myself of the real world, but it's served another function. A lot of people come through the office, and I've noticed, some of them look at it, I've noticed over the years that uh, people from the United States, almost nobody has a clue what it is. Uh, from Latin America, almost everybody knows what it is. From Europe, it's maybe 10%. I mean, if anything remotely like that had happened, say, in Czechoslovakia, uh, we wouldn't even have to talk about it because we probably would have had a nuclear war. Uh, if we hadn't, everybody would know about the utter barbarism of the St Stalinist uh, monsters. Well, that's not untypical, unfortunately. It happens to be a 
graphic example, but it's pretty normal. Well, let's turn finally to the occasion for the current meeting, 9-11. Uh, this is the 10th anniversary and also the bin Laden assassination. Uh, both the beginning and the end of uh, this period illustrate pretty well what uh, the, the prevailing patterns. So it takes a 9-11, uh, obviously a horrendous uh, atrocity, enormous historical significance, uh, standard cliche about it is it changed the world. Uh, you're familiar with it, don't have to go into it. We just had a big commemoration of it. Uh, it was pretty awful. Uh, it could have been worse. Uh, in fact, it's kind of useful to try a thought experiment. So suppose, for example, that, you know, that a, a plane was downed in Pennsylvania by the passengers. Uh, suppose that it hadn't been downed. Uh, suppose it continued. It was apparently aiming at the White House. I suppose it had hit the White House, it killed the president, uh, put into operation a plan already established to, uh, to impose a military dictatorship in the country. It did that. The military dictatorship took over, dismantled the entire parliamentary system, uh, very quickly killed some three to 6,000 people, went on to torture about 30,000, established a major terrorist center in the United States which was carrying out assassinations all over the world, uh, overthrowing governments, installing, helping install similar dictatorships and kind of just icing on the cake, uh, brought in a group of economists who took over the economy and very quickly drove the American economy into the worst crisis, one of the worst crises of its history. Well, that would have been a lot worse than 9-11. And it happened. And you should all know that it happened on 9-11. Uh, that's what called, what's called in Latin America the first 9-11, 9-11, uh, uh, 1973. That's the coup in uh, Chile, which uh, installed a grotesque uh, dictatorship. Uh, well, that, uh, 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 that's considered of no significance. In fact, Henry Kissinger, one of the people responsible, directly responsible, informed his boss, Richard Nixon, right afterwards that it's of no historical significance. It didn't change the world. Nobody says that. It just changed reality. In fact, a lot more than what we call 9-11. Uh, interesting background for it. I won't talk about it. Actually, the historical significance of the first 9-11 goes way beyond that horrifying event itself. Uh, it was one incident in an evolving uh, process, much larger process. Uh, that process has a lot of background, but it really took off in 1962. In 1962, John F. Kennedy made a very significant decision. He shifted the mission of the Latin American military, which of course we can do, uh, shifted it from hemispheric defense to internal security. Hemispheric defense was kind of left over from World War II, didn't mean anything. Internal security means a lot. That's a war against the population. And it's exactly what happened. Uh, quite predictably, uh, well, I won't give it in my words. Uh, let me read you the description of uh, Charles Machling. He was in charge of uh, counterinsurgency and internal defense planning under Kennedy and Johnson. He says that the 1962 decision led to a shift from toleration of the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military to direct complicity in their crimes to U.S. support for the methods of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads. Not, a, not inaccurate. Uh, first case in point was the imposition of the military dictatorship in Brazil planned under the Kennedy administration, implemented shortly after his assassination. Brazil's a big country, had a domino effect. They started toppling all over the South America. The Chilean uh, uh, atrocities were one case of it, and they expedited others. And it went on. Uh, the worst of them all was uh, Argentina, late 70s, early 80s. That was incidentally Reagan's favorite. He loved Argentina. It was the worst, most monstrous terrorist state probably in the history of Latin America, one of the worst ever, anywhere. In the 1980s, the plague reached Central America. Reagan's wars killed a couple hundred thousand people. They came to their symbolic end with uh, uh, the murder of the Jesuits. 
Uh, there were other events in 1962. I don't have time to go into them, but I'll mention one which was quite important and places all of this in a much broader historical pattern and illustrates its far-reaching historic significance. In 1962, as you should know, uh, there was a remarkable change in the Catholic Church. That's the year of Vatican II. Uh, Pope John XXIII made an extremely significant decision. He decided to return the church to its roots. First couple of centuries, Christians were persecuted. Uh, Hans Kung, famous theologian, uh, points out that in the fourth century, when Emperor Constantine took over Christianity, made it the official religion of the uh, uh, Roman Empire, the church turned from a church of the persecuted to a church of the persecutors. And that's pretty much what it remained. Uh, in 1962, Pope John wanted to reverse that. He wanted to return the church to the Gospels, which have a radical pacifist message. That's why Christians were persecuted. Uh, King describes that as one of the greatest moments in the history of the church. And it was, quite, it was very significant. The message of Vatican II was taken up particularly in Latin America by Latin American bishops, uh, uh, priests, uh, nuns, uh, lay people, uh, undertook what they called the preferential option for the poor, that comes right out of the Gospels, and uh, tried to bring it to poor, suffering people, people trying to survive somehow under the boots of U.S. power, which is what it is. So take it to peasants, uh, have them form base communities, read the Gospels, try to take over control of their own lives somehow. That set in motion a reaction here, which was pretty shocking. It set in motion a war against the church from 1962 up to 1989, and fact traces continue, the U.S. was engaged in a major war against the church. That's why you have a long sequence of religious martyrs. That's why you have you know, the assassination of Romero, of the six Jesuit intellectuals, and many others. And there's no question, and it was, it was very, pretty brutal. I mean, Latin America went through a horrendous plague in this period. Uh, and liberation theology was pretty much destroyed. And there's no question about the responsibility for it, because the perpetrators uh, take pride in it and say so. Uh, they don't concede that they did it. They boast that they did it. So if you go to the, say, School of the Americas, you know, the famous, has a different name now, the school where they train Latin American killers. Uh, it's not the way they describe it. I'm describing the facts. Uh, the School of the Americas has talking points, how you advertise your marvels to the people who come. Uh, one of the talking points is uh, that the U.S. Army helped destroy liberation theology, that is, Christianity, the Christianity of the Gospels. We're very proud of that. And in fact, yes, it happened. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's 1962. Let's come to 2011. Uh, try another thought experiment. Uh, suppose that, uh, say, a group of Iraqi commandos uh, landed at George Bush's compound, uh, found him undefended, unprotected. Let's say his wife was there. Uh, suppose uh, she lunged at them and they shot her. Uh, and uh, then they uh, apprehended uh, George W. Bush, uh, killed him, we don't know how, uh, threw his body into the Gulf of Mexico without... Uh, uh, without an autopsy. Uh, we think that's a little unpleasant. Uh, it's not a thought experiment either. It happened. It happened on May 2nd uh, of this year. Um, a little different, however. The person who was killed by the Navy SEALs in Pakistan, undefended, unprotected, uh, was uh, the prime suspect for 9-11. George Bush is not a suspect. He's what he called the decider the person who made the decisions to carry out crimes that vastly exceed anything attributed to bin Laden. If people don't know this, they have a lot to learn. It shouldn't be controversial. If it is controversial, that's a sign of serious deficiencies in our intellectual and moral culture. I won't go into it. I wrote about this at the time, total hysteria, as you can imagine. 
And a lot of it's just kind of shrieking and so on. But some of it was pretty serious and interesting. So I'll just keep to that part. Uh, the most serious commentary on this, of course, bitterly condemning it, was by a well-known, uh, quite good, um, kind of left liberal commentator, Matthew Iglesias. Uh, he, uh, his uh, uh, commentary is quite interesting because it, it, it describes very clearly the difference between responsible intellectuals and wild men in the wings. That's me in this case. The, uh, he says that the sober, serious intellectuals uh, might criticize the invasion, assassination, so, and so on. They might criticize it as a, a tactical mistake. But to go beyond that, he says, is amazingly naive. That's me. And that's true. I'm amazingly naive. The reason is one of the main functions of the international institutional order is precisely to legitimate the use of deadly military force by Western powers. The Western powers means the United States, not Norway. Uh, the, uh, now, that's not a criticism. He's saying it's a good thing. It's uh, amazingly naive to uh, question this. Well, in fact, I think there's a fair amount of truth to what he said. He's kind of exaggerating. Maybe he'd read that in a Maoist pamphlet. But he's sort of got a point, and I think it's basically correct. The difference between us is I don't think it's a good thing, and he thinks it's a wonderful thing. Uh, well, that's the traditional difference, going back to the origins of the term, modern term intellectual and all the way back in history. And I think he should be praised for kind of drawing aside the veils of deception and uh, formulating the issues so clearly. Actually, to be more precise, formulating the non-issue so clearly, because within the mainstream, this is a complete non-issue, barely with exception. Uh, you can be a responsible intellectual and say maybe it was a tactical mistake, but if you go an inch beyond that, you're just a wild man in the wings. Thanks. You're, you're probably pretty good at taking them for yourself. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there a mic down there? Yes. Where's the mic? Okay, yeah. So people want to say something, come to the mic. Hi. Uh, thank you for being with us today, Professor right. Chomsky. Can you speak up? Um, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate your time, and, and it was a great lecture. Um, as you may know, we're broadcasting this live online. And we've encouraged uh, our social media followers at Boston Review to um, submit questions to be asked. And uh, one of our, I believe, Serbian followers on Twitter sent the question, uh, what is the reason for the notable absence of intellectuals and social movements and initiatives in the Middle East? Sorry, what I didn't catch. What, was the, uh, what is the reason for the notable absence, Absent. of, absence of intellectuals in the social movements and initiatives happening in the Middle East? And he wonders if that's uh, because they are less independent of capital in those places than in others, the intellectuals. You mean why are there social movements in the Middle East and, say, not in Europe and here? Or why are the intellectuals of the Middle East not as involved? As not as involved? Not, that's the question, yes. Well, that depends what you mean by intellectuals. So, uh, say, take Egypt, the most important country, the, the January 25th movement, you know, the, the Tahrir Square, all that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the people who kind of sparked it were young intellectuals, uh, kind of uh, you know, tech-savvy young people, people like you. Now, uh, uh, interestingly, they, and that's the way it's described, and not incorrectly, so yes, they did it. And other, you know, quite a few uh, leading intellectuals are participating. Uh, it's a little misleading, and you can see how misleading it is by thinking about the name of the movement that they sparked. They called it the April 6th movement. The reason for the name is because on April 6th, 2008, there were 
major strike actions called by the labor unions, harshly repressed but very militant labor unions in Egypt. Uh, they were going to have a strike at the main industrial complex, Mahala textile conglomerate, and also other strikes elsewhere and support demonstrations and so on. Well, it was all crushed by the US-backed dictatorship. But they didn't forget it. I mean, we forget it. In fact, probably never heard of it. But they didn't forget it, which is rather typical. The victims have different kind of memories than the perpetrators. And uh, that was the April 6th movement. And suddenly the same happened in Tunisia, the, the other country that's had some progress towards democracy. In both cases, uh, a kind of a core element, leading element, is a, an active militant labor movement that had been struggling for years. Now, in the West, here we don't notice things like that. There aren't supposed to be labor movements. But there, uh, yeah, that's what's happening. Actually, there's some very good scholarship on this by one of your colleagues. Uh, Joel Bynan at uh, Stanford has been working on labor movements in the Arab world in North Africa for years, and he's written a couple of recent articles on it. And one thing he points out, pretty convincingly, I think, is that uh, if, if you look at the success and failure of the uprisings, they're pretty closely correlated with uh, whether there's a long-standing militant labor movement that kind of moved to the center of them as soon as they took off. But they were sparked by uh, intellectuals. They took some of the first steps, young intellectuals. Again, people like you. And uh, that's not unusual. Um, students, for example, have been in the forefront of an awful lot of activism over the years, students and young professionals. And I, I, uh, here too, I mean, MIT, for example, was totally transformed in the 60s. It became a much more civilized place, it, literally. It was just totally different than it was before in a lot of ways. And that was mostly the work of a very small group of students uh, who many of them went on to do other really good things, uh, Mike Albert, Steve Shalom, others, who just changed the place. You know? And uh, it's never been the same since, it's to, to the good. So yes, uh, on the other hand, if you look at uh, more established intellectuals, it's rare. Uh, here or almost anywhere. Uh, you, you can ask why. I don't think it's too hard to figure out. But let me just give you one example from MIT. It's back in, you, you may remember this, so f f fix up the details if I get it wrong. You know, old memory. Uh, in the mid-70s, the administration made a deal with the Shah, a vicious tyrant installed by U.S. British military coup. The deal was to virtually sell the nuclear engineering department to him. It didn't say it that way, but the idea is he would give a ton of money to MIT, and there would be special uh, advantage, uh, special dispensation for Iranian nuclear engineers to come to the United States and learn how to develop um, nuclear energy, which of course means nuclear weapons. Uh, well, it was kept kind of quiet, but like everything else, it leaked. Uh, when it leaked, there was a, some very interesting consequence. Uh, it spread around the student body very quickly, and there was enormous opposition. You know, meetings, demonstrations, every crazy thing you like. Uh, so much opposition that there was finally a referendum taken among the students, and I think it was about 80% opposition. Well, at that point, the faculty had to get galvanized a little. Uh, usually, faculty meetings are so boring that nobody goes unless they have to present a report or something. But every once in a while, everybody goes to the faculty meeting. Uh, when the fa This faculty meeting was called, uh, well, maybe a thousand people there, everybody came. And there was a big discussion and debate about should MIT accept this deal with the Shah for you know, handing over the nuclear energy department uh, to the Shah. And I, uh, after a long debate, uh, were you at that meeting? You weren't. At that, uh, after the, de the debate, there was a vote. And it was also like about 80%, but in the opposite direction. About maybe 80% of the faculty approved of it. Now, if you think about it, the faculty at that meeting had been students 10 years earlier. You know. So what happened? 
Well, I think you can figure it out. They're playing a different institutional role. Uh, and that changed their attitudes towards these things. Should we help Iran develop the basis for nuclear weapons, or shouldn't we? Uh, and that's not unusual. It's typical of what happens often. It's worth thinking about, especially as you go make that transition, those of you who are students. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Professor Chomsky. Um, if uh, you got to be the decider for the next, say, 10 years, um, what would you do as far as US foreign policy moving forward? Like, there is, is there sort of a handful of things that you'd like to see happen? Sure. I mean, uh, 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 there's one, some, one very simple thing. Uh, I'd like to see some of the rhetoric taken seriously. OK, so if you read, I mean, even left liberal journals like, say, The Nation this week. I happened to read a journal, an article yesterday by quite a good person who is critical of US policy in the Middle East. Because Obama, I wish I could get, look it up and see if I got the wording right. It's something like this. He said, the problem is that Obama has given up the militant pro-democracy efforts of the Bush administration. And that was a mistake. He should continue those democracy efforts which were completely directed to trying to undermine and destroy democracy, literally. I mean, there's actually pretty good scholarship on this. But the official line is, we promote democracy. Actually, there's very good work on this, if you want to learn about it. The, the best scholarly work on this topic is by a guy named uh, Thomas Carruthers, who's a, a good scholar. He was head of the Carnegie Endowment uh, Law and Democracy Project, or something like that. Uh, and a scholar who's dealt with these questions for a long time. He also writes from the inside. He was in Reagan's State Department working on democracy enhancement programs. And he takes it all very seriously. He says that's the right kind of thing to do. But he's a very honest scholar. And he just goes through the facts. And what he concludes, carrying it right into the Bush years, I think his last book is maybe 2006 or so. He says, uh, every American president is schizophrenic. They all have a kind of psychological disorder of some kind. They support democracy if and only if it conforms to strategic and economic objectives. Uh, so we're all in favor of democracy in Eastern Europe, but not around here, please, not in Central America or South America. And then he goes through the Reagan, and it was, that's true of the Bush years, too. The, uh, so democracy in Iran would be great, but not in Egypt. You know? and, uh, the, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, his writings on Latin America are particularly interesting because that's the region under most US influence and where he was directly involved. So about the Reagan administration, which was all full of you know, democracy talk, uh, he says the programs which he was involved in, he said they were sincere but misguided. And he describes how they were misguided. Uh, they, the US under Reagan supported uh, uh, opposed democracy in the southern, in the areas where it had least influence, South America. And that's where most of the progress was, considerable progress, even though the Reagan administration blocked it every step of the way. Still, they made progress. In the areas where we had more influence nearby, he says progress was least. And the reason was the United States would only tolerate top down forms of democracy in which traditional elites with links to the United States remain in power. That's virtually a quote. That's quite true. And the same is true of Bush's democracy promotion. I won't go through the details, but they're pretty obvious. But it's part of the, it's, it's a doctrine, which is fine. We should promote democracy. And there are pretty good reasons why the government isn't doing it. It's not because they hate democracy. It's because of what democracy would bring. The uh, same reason why uh, the Trilateral Commission uh, was concerned about democracy here. And it's only you can go back and read James Madison saying similar things uh, all the way back. I won't go into it. But just take uh, the Arab Spring, which you mentioned. Uh, there's very good reasons why the United States and its allies are going to do anything they can to prevent democracy in the Arab world. And you can pretty quickly figure it out. Uh, there are polls of Arab public opinion taken by the leading American polling institutions. Uh, 
released by you know, the Brookings Institution. They're not hard to find. Not published, not reported, barely reported, but they're there and you can find them. And they, what they tell you is exactly why the US and its allies will do what they can to block democracy in places like Egypt. So take, say, Egypt. Uh, last poll about a year ago found that uh, among Egyptians, uh, about 90% think that uh, the United States and Israel are the main threats they face. Uh, they oppose US policy so strongly that about 80% think the region would be better off if Iran had nuclear weapons. Now, other polls show they don't like Iran, don't like it at all. Nevertheless, if it can somehow balance US power, better if they have nuclear weapons. Um, virtually none think of Iran as a threat, although they don't like it, so maybe 10%. Uh, is that what the United States wants to see in power in Egypt? Now, if you have a democracy, to the extent that you have a functioning democracy, public opinion will have some influence. Does the United States want to be thrown out of the Middle East? And so this extent generalized pretty much over the region. Uh, different numbers, but roughly the same. Well, you know, you're not going to support democracy if that's the case. And this goes as far back as you like. So take, go back to the 1950s. Uh, in 1958, uh, you all know that uh, after 9-11, George Bush made a plaintive uh, plea, uh, you know, why do they hate us? Uh, they hate our freedoms. Uh, right after he produced that, the Pentagon initiated a study to ask, you know, why do they hate us? And they concluded very straight, they don't hate our freedoms, they hate our policies. And they went into the details and gave reasons. Uh, so in fact, they could have gone on and said, the truth is we hate their freedoms. And we hate them for quite a good reason. You go back to the 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower raised with his staff, it's all classified, all been declassified for years. Uh, he raised with his staff the question, uh, why is there a campaign of hatred against us in the Middle East? And not among the governments, pretty supportive, uh, but, against, but, but among the populations. Uh, the National Security Council, you know, main planning agency, had just come out with a significant study on that forgot the number, but you can find it. It's like January 1958, in which they, uh, they concluded that uh, there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States blocks democracy and development, and that we support harsh and brutal dictatorships, and we do it because we want to ensure control over their energy supplies. And I went on to say that the perception's more or less accurate, and furthermore, that's exactly what we should be doing. So let's continue. And yeah, that's true. And you sample the intermediate periods. I won't take time to find the same thing. So in answer to your question, one policy initiative that could be taken is to pay some attention to the words. So yeah, let's support democracy, even if we don't like the outcome. Uh, this is very much on the front pages today. I mean, there has been one free election in the Arab world during the Bush years. So there's a way to tell how much they love democracy. Uh, it was in Palestine, January 2006. First and only free, really free election in the Arab world. Very well monitored, you know, every, uh, recognized to be quite free and fair. Uh, the day after the election, the United States imposed harsh sanctions on the Palestinians. Why? The election came out the wrong way. They didn't vote for the people we wanted. So therefore, we have to punish them. Uh, that's, and they're, pretty, they're quite harsh sanctions, in fact, along with Israel, of course. And along after, uh, right after that, the US put in motion plans to carry out a military coup. A year later, in fact, those plans began to be implemented, but the, uh, this is in Gaza, uh, Hamas, which is there, got wind of it and managed to put it down. At that point, the sanctions became much harsher and major siege was imposed. So the population would be kept at virtual starvation levels. And uh, so it continues. That's the way we react when there's a free election that comes out the wrong way. You know, it could hardly be more dramatic, but there's an alternative. We could support free elections and we could support democracy. 
even if you don't like the uh, supporting democracy means you support it whether or like you not, whether or not you like the outcome. And there's plenty more. Uh, so for example, take uh, uh, U.S. power is in many respects declining, but not in one dimension. It's enormous. That's military power. The uh, U.S. spends about as much as the rest of the world combined. It's technologically far more advanced. Uh, right now, the U.S. is involved in uh, military action in half a dozen countries, at least, maybe more. Uh, depending on how you count, there are almost 100 countries where one or another form of military action is going on, either bases or special forces operations or training for state security forces, which just suppress the population. I think it's 97 countries right now. A huge drain on the budget, of course, but uh, in some ways, in some ways, you know, it depends how you count. But it's, uh, I'm not in favor of that. I think that should be stopped. Uh, Obama, in particular, has torn up the most elementary commit commitments of American law. You know, if you're an old-fashioned conservative like me, you can think back 10 years. There used to be a principle that unless somebody is sentenced, he's, in it, he's innocent. You know, remember something called innocent until proven guilty? Unless you're sentenced, you can be a sub suspect, but you're not guilty. I mean, was Obama, Osama bin Laden sentenced? Well, they made sure he wouldn't be sentenced. They killed him instead of bringing him for a to a trial, which they could have done. And that's now huge. Uh, Obama is running assassination campaigns all over the world. Uh, some of the commentators, military historians, have talked about this, point out this big shift between the Bush and Obama administration in this respect. Uh, Bush kidnapped suspects, uh, put them in torture chambers, you know, tortured them, you know, pretty unpleasant. Uh, Obama just kills them, and that's uh, going on all over the, all over much of the world. You think the people like it? I mean, take say Pakistan, which is one of the main targets. It's led to a rise in anti-Americanism, which is and it's always been high. Now it's kind of like you know, a huge part of the population really wants to destroy the United States. Not surprisingly, I mean, if we had drones flying around which are terror weapons, every once in a while, you know, attacking some group and killing people, we wouldn't be too pleased about it. Uh, and that's what's happening there. And the, the, the specialists on it, Pakistan are pretty, you know, they're not doves. People like Anatol Yevin, one of the main Pakistan specialists, also a student of the Pakistani military, just came out with an important book on this. Uh, he points out that... Uh, the Pakistani army is the one stable institution in the country. It's a very professional army. They said they are dedicated to protecting Pakistani sovereignty. They are very bitter now, as is the whole population, uh, because the U.S. is uh, attacking their sovereignty with drone attacks, and they were furious about the, uh, uh, the bin Laden assassination, which uh, naturally, uh, and is trying to press them into entering into the American war in Afghanistan. Now, they don't like, the, the Pakistanis do not like, overwhelmingly, do not like the Afghan Taliban, but they recognize them as defending their country from a foreign invasion. In fact, their attitude toward the Afghan Taliban now is pretty much like it was towards the uh, Mujahideen in the 80s you know, resisting the Russian invasion. They weren't popular, they didn't like them, but they saw them as people defending their country against a foreign attack. Actually, we did too then, because it was somebody else attacking them. Now it's us attacking them, so it's terrorism. But uh, they're being forced into fighting an American war, which they don't like and which is harming them. It's driving the Afghan Taliban into <laughs> Pakistan, where they're causing them all kind of troubles and arousing Pakistani Taliban, uh, they're being pressured by the United States to attack regions of Pakistan, which were left, you know, parts of Pakistan are kind of a tribal society, uh, and they were kind of left alone, even by the British. They kind of run their own business. But the U.S. is pressuring Pakistani army to go after them. They don't want to do it. They're very bitter. 
In the case of the bin Laden assassination, there's quite an important feature of it, which pretty remarkably wasn't discussed here. Uh, the SEALs, Navy SEALs, who went in to kill bin Laden, which was the mission, not capture him, kill him, they had instructions to fight their way out if they had to. Now think about that for a minute. If they were going to fight their way out, they would certainly have gotten air support. They might have gotten ground support. The Pakistani army would almost certainly have resisted. We'd be in a war with Pakistan. Pakistan has a major army. It has a huge nuclear weapons force, one of the fastest, maybe the fastest growing in the world. There's also a jihadi element there. It's not huge, but it's there. It's one of Reagan's legacies, incidentally. Uh, and those two forces might combine. It's not that it hasn't been discussed. It has, even in WikiLeaks, it's discussed by the American ambassador. Uh, the consequence of the drone attacks. Uh, Gavin goes into it, too. If these forces combine, uh, you can, you're going to get uh, nuclear weapons going on in New York, in New York and London. You know? That was the risk that was taken by Obama uh, in order to assassinate a suspect. Yeah. It, it's, it's not that the security of Americans is a high priority. Uh, governments, states do not care that much about the security of their populations. <coughs> Plenty of evidence about that. Well, you know, if you ask what things should be changed, I think things like this should be changed. And it's not hard to go on. Uh, we should not only be supporting democracy in those regions, we should support, be supporting constructive development. And elsewhere, too, there's plenty of things we ought to be doing here. So I, I don't think it's hard to think of quite realistic uh, changes of policy that wouldn't be utopia, but at least would be you know, kind of more or less decent. Actually, let me just make one comment about the United States. Uh, we're supposed to have a deficit problem. I I think that's a fraud myself, but let's agree we have a deficit problem. Well, how do you deal with the deficit? Well, for one thing, you look at what causes it. It's not a big secret. You know, most of the deficit here, aside from military spending, which is out of sight, is caused by the health system. The U.S. health system is an international scandal. That's about twice the per capita cost of comparable countries. That's some of the worst outcomes. And it's the only privatized, un, virtually unregulated system, which is extremely inefficient. Apart from being very cruel, it means essentially you kind of, you know, you get health care more or less uh, based on wealth, not on need. I mean, people like me benefit from that, I should say, but it's the way it works. If we had a health system like other industrial countries, which is not a utopian ideal, there wouldn't be any deficit. In fact, there'd probably be a surplus. So there are policy choices which are by no means utopian that could be made if it were not for the way power is distrib distributed here. You can't do anything that the financial institutions oppose. They buy the presidency. They buy the Congress. Uh, they actually buy the chairmanships of committees. Uh, yeah, OK, so nothing happens. Those are not laws of nature. Uh, people can do things about that. Hi, Noam. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be real loud. Is there a way within uh, kind of our global capitalist system to stop ecological crises, you know, climate change, et cetera, as well as create a, a more equitable distribution of wealth so that you know, you don't have a billion people living on less than a dollar a day and, and other horrible atrocities, this kind of capitalism with a friendly face, or must the system change? And, you know, then the, the corollary, of course, is how? What? I, I, I understood what you said, but is there a question? <laughs> what, or must the system change? How, where must the system change? So it must change, so then, then how? Well, you can, you know, there are plenty of small things that could be done which would make a huge difference, even within the framework of existing institutions. Like everything I've just described doesn't barely modifies institutions. In fact, it sort of is just a suggestion that we uh, uh, act within the doctrinal framework that we're supposed to approve of and can be done. Uh, on, say, a billion people 
living on a dollar a day. That's a, you know, Amnesty International came out with a report a couple of years ago in which they argued that the worst human rights violation is poverty, which is, there's a book on it by the director of AI. That's quite sensible. Poverty has enormous human rights effects. So for example, the Lancet, the main medical journal in the world, Britain, uh, they had an article not long ago uh, in which they estimated that if very simple medical procedures, very simple ones, it could be done by paramedics, that were available all over the world, uh, you could save six, six million children every year, okay? Six million children, killing six million children is a lot of people. Uh, that takes nothing. No, it takes, this is, they estimated the cost to the rich countries, I mean, the undetectable, you know. So sure, there are things like that can be done. You mentioned climate change, that's the biggest one. And what's happening today is utterly shocking. I mean, take the Western Hemisphere. The country that's in the forefront of trying to do something about climate change and have taken some pretty significant steps is the poorest country in South America, Bolivia. In fact, they're in the lead internationally. The country that's dragging it all down and in fact going backwards is the richest country in world history, namely us. In fact, right at this moment, Congress is not only not going forward, it's actually dismantling uh, the structures that were put into place by the last liberal president in the United States, Richard Nixon. That's not a joke. Uh, the EPA, for example, is one of a number of uh, steps that were instituted under the Nixon administration. They're not, it's not being dismantled. I mean, you may have read a story in the New York Times maybe a day or two ago, front page story, about uh, you know, we can finally, maybe there's some hope now for getting out of energy dependence. You know, huge, all kind of fancy new techniques, you know, fracking, this, that, and the other thing. I mean, environment, environmentally horrible, but they, they, they could allow a huge increase in the production of oil. There wasn't one word in the story saying that that's a huge acceleration of destruction of the possibility for a society in which our grandchildren can live. That's just not an issue, you know? Uh, we have to make, corporations have to make profit tomorrow. If uh, the world goes down the tube, it's not their business. And we're in the lead on this. You know, as I said, richest, most powerful country in human history. And we're destroying the possibility of decent future existence. It's not a small thing. Also raising the threat of nuclear war. Like what I just mentioned with the um, uh, Bin Laden assassination, one small example. In fact, let me make one more comment about that. I see you want to end this, yeah. Okay, so one final comment on the, the two major threats to survival. It's been around for a while, getting worse. One is environmental destruction, the other is nuclear war. Is there anything we can do about it? Well, you, you know, you read strategic analysis literature, you know, the press, uh, commentary. The big threat now is that Iran might develop nuclear weapons. Is there a way to, whether, how much of a threat it is we could debate, but let's say it's a threat. Like as I said, the Arab world doesn't think so. They prefer that they have them. But in fact, most of the world doesn't think it's a threat, but say it is. Is there anything we can do about it? Yeah, something very simple. There's an overwhelming international consensus, so strong that the United States has to formally agree, though back down, uh, uh, for establishing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Nuclear weapons-free zone means none of the states in the region can develop nuclear weapons. Uh, all of their nuclear facilities have to be under IAEA, you know, International Atomic Energy Agency uh, supervision. Uh, it wouldn't eliminate every possible threat, but it would certainly lessen the threat significantly. It would also mean that U.S. forces there can't deploy nuclear weapons. Uh, well, that's a step that, which is certainly feasible. The, in, virtually the entire world is strongly in favor of it, including the countries of the region. Uh, at the last non-proliferation treaty meeting, just last May, I guess, in New York, uh, the uh, support for it was so strong that the Obama administration had to formally agree. But 
Hillary Clinton put in a proviso. He said, great idea, but not now. Furthermore, Israel has to be excluded. And secondly, any provision that requires that Israel or any country that helps it give information about nuclear weapons is unacceptable. Okay, little footnote. Okay, end of nuclear weapons-free zone. Uh, you know, that ought to be front page news. I mean, here's a very good way to deal with the alleged problem that's supposed to be the major nuclear weapons issue, and the U.S. simply refuses to go along. Uh, there's another point about that with which I'll end. Uh, if that's the front page story, the continuation story ought to say that the United States and Britain are specifically committed to this more than any other power for a very simple reason, which you can quickly find out by a little bit of research. Uh, when the U.S. and Britain invaded Iraq in 2003, uh, they tried to give a kind of a legal cover to it, very thin legal cover. The legal cover was, as you recall, that uh, Saddam Hussein was running nuclear weapons programs, and uh, he was committed under a Security Council resolution, 687, 1991. He was committed to terminate all nuclear weapons programs. He didn't do it, therefore we're entitled to invade. I mean, the legal argument is too ludicrous to discuss, but at least it was there. Okay. Well, you take a look at, Art at Resolution 687. Pick it up on the Internet. Uh, go to Article 14. It commits every signer to work for a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. That's the U.S. and Britain, the ones who invoked 687 to go to war against Iraq. I mean, is that undiscussable, you know? I mean, what, you know, uh, what world do we live in? It's perfectly obvious. Why isn't it taught in elementary school, or in universities at least? Well, that's the kind of thing that people like you can do something about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, great. And thank you all for coming.